Thank you so much, Clint. That was a great worship set. Hey, tomorrow, let's go really old school. Let's sing that last, what's the, the last verse right behind that? Remember? With the ransom. With the ransom and glory. How's it go? Faithful, I will always see. It will be my joy through the ages to sing of your love and mercy. Look, he's got it in him. This joker's got it in him. Yeah, that's my favorite part, man. That'll be a good one. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's come back out and do it again. You ever, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm so glad to see you guys here tonight. Hey, I thought I'd start off with something funny that'll kind of dovetail right into the um, subject tonight. My son, Elijah, he's like the subject of a lot of my illustrations. Reason is my daughter's perfect and he's not. And so that's why you don't hear me talk about her a lot. Um, <clears throat> it's just perfection. You know what I mean? Um, but my son, Elijah, he's on the autism spectrum. He's, he's ADD and all the other stuff. He keeps us going. He is, um, he, he, he's scared to go upstairs because his room's dark. I wouldn't use the word scare because, you know, he's a big kid. So he's, let's find another word. He's terrified to go upstairs and um, uh, by himself especially. And um, so the other morning I got up before him and I, I've got a room on the same uh, level as, as his upstairs. But um, I've got a little little space on the other side of the hall. So his room's over here, my room's over here. And it's got some set of steps that goes up to a little bitty room that I use to, to pray in. So I'm on the bottom step. I'm sitting on the bottom step there. And I knew he had slept on the couch the night before and I'm sitting on the bottom step because before I get into the presence of God uh, in my little prayer room up there, I always stop on the first step, sit down, and I'll think about the day before and say, hey, is there anything that I need to examine in myself? Is there anything that I need to ask forgiveness of or do I need to get right of or repent of before getting along with God? So I don't take another step until I do that, which is a good principle for us. So I'm sitting there, I don't know, two, three, four hours, something like that repenting I'm and uh i'm kidding i'm there a few minutes and i hear hear him downstairs he says hey daddy daddy and he don't know that i'm behind the door i'm on the same level over there behind the door daddy and so i said uh yeah bubs you, yeah the moment i say that he knows i'm upstairs brrr, i mean he's flying up them stairs you ain't never heard anybody go so fast up the stairs it's, boop, 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 boop. i'm like golly and then I, boop, 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 boop. It just stops. And I'm on the other side of the door, and I knew exactly what it was because he had walked over there, and there's his room, dark. In his imagination, there's no telling what size monster is in there. You know what I'm saying? Because we don't know. We don't know if there's a monster in there or not. You don't know. I don't know. We say there's not, but there might be. No one has ever seen it. And so he stops there at the bed, and I knew it because I'm on the other side of the door, and I'm hearing it. So I know what he's doing. He's stretching as far as he can to just flick it just flick the light you know get some illumination up in here and so i'm laughing i'm sitting on the steps with him and i open the door i said hey buddy and he turns around and i know what he thinks i'm gonna say because i say this all the time stop being a sissy and go into your room and get your school clothes now if you think that's harsh guess what you can raise your kids however you want to raise them <laughs> i just I don't know. I want mine to be able to go up a flight of stairs on their own. I mean, fast forward this thing 25 years from now. He's going for the big promotion. He gets there early because he's prompt. There's a flight of stairs. And I can imagine us talking about this on the way home when he comes home. How did it go? Did you get the promotion? Well, here's the thing, Dad. There was a flight of stairs, and I wasn't about to go up there. You know what I mean? We got to knock this stuff out now. And so he turns around. He looks at me like, oh, here he goes with the get in there, you sissy. Don't be a sissy. Put your school clothes on. And I open the door. I say, hey, buddy. And his hair turns around. His hair is like this, y'all. It was like Doc off of Back to the Future. And he turns around. I said, um, you want Daddy to go in that dark place with you? Yeah. I mean, you can just see him. Yeah. So I walk over. There. I said, you want, you want Daddy to go in this dark place with you? Oh, yeah. So then it's just like all, he's just relaxed. His whole, all his fears in the whole world go away. We go in there. We get his clothes. We only kill one monster. It wasn't that bad. It was a little one. And we, he takes off leaving. And before he leaves, before I flick the light back off, I look and there's a little bitty speck of glass shining right on the ladder before his bunk bed, right there at the bottom where he climbs up every night. So I pick it up and I walk back up into my quiet time and I'm laughing because I said he wasn't expecting me to go in there with him and boy, ain't that something how his whole body just when I when, when he saw me come over there when I grabbed his hand his whole body just we're, we're good and I picked that speck up and I actually should have brought it tonight but I, I keep it in my quiet time 
because it dawned on me when I sat down, I thought, isn't that interesting? Um, he would have stepped on that in that dark place just a few hours later that night when we told him to go, he, and it would have injured him. But just like God does with us, he goes before us and removes stuff that would harm us if we run to him. And I sat down and I thought, man, we all run to something, don't we? Don't, don't, don't act like I'm the only one in the room. When we're up under pressure, when we have adversity, when life turns us on our heads, so to speak, when the unexpected happens to us, when we lose the job, when we get the call that we've lost a loved one, when these things happen and the pressure begins to amount up, we all run to something. We do. We run to, 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 to the wrong people sometimes. We run to the wrong places. We run to the bottle. We run to the pills. We all run somewhere. For some of us, we run back. We run back to familiar things or people or places because they're familiar. And there's something good that feels about familiar because we know it, right? But familiar is not always healthy. But all of us run to something or someone or something when we have pressure in our lives, when we have adversity in our lives. The question, though, is where do you run? <laughs> Where do you run when the pressure comes? Where do you run when, when adversity comes? When life turn, makes a turn that you did not see coming, where do you go? And for the story of David, as we pick back up in the story today, we see David doing something that all of us do it sometimes under pressure. We see David, the man of God, running. We see him running. He's up under pressure. He's in fear for his life. Things are going good up until this point, but he kills a giant, marries the king's daughter, and his whole life turns upside down. And now David is a man on the run, and his father-in-law is the king who has all the power in the world, and his father-in-law is jealous, he's enraged, he's throwing spears, and this is where the story picks back up for us tonight. He had just thrown not the first, not the second, but the third spear at your boy David. <laughs> and here's where it picks up. It says, so David fled and escaped that night. What's fled and escaped? That means he's running. He's, he, he's running. Verse 11 says, so Saul also sent messengers to David's house. So after he flees from the spear, he sends messengers to his house to watch him, to kill him in the morning. And you thought your father-in-law was bad. <laughs> you thought your mother-in-law was bad. I mean, look at David. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, if you do not save yourself tonight, your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. Verse 12 says, so Michael let David down through a window. And he went and he fled. And he escaped. Second time, we see him running. The pressure comes. The adversity comes. The unexpected comes. And he flees, and he escapes, and he's running. Verse 13 says that Michael took the household idol, laid it on the bed, put a quilt of goat's hair at his head, covered it with clothing. She's making a scarecrow. <laughs> and when Saul sent messengers to, to take David, she said, no, 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 he, he's in bed. He's sick. Now, before we move on, we got some places to go here today, okay? Let me just pause for just a second because that's pretty significant. Just want to hop over it, but it's pretty significant that David would marry a woman who has an idol the size of a human being in her bed. I mean, it fooled Saul's service. What is the man of God doing with a wife that has a household idol? I believe that David had no clue because David would have slayed the thing. There ain't no way your boy David would have had an idol. And you know what those household idols did? This is hilarious. They brought peace among the family. How's that going for you? You just let your husband down the window. The dad, your, your father's trying to, you know, kill your, your husband. But it makes us ask a question. I think before we move on, we ought to ask, is there any idol in the home of your heart? You know, sometimes we got to do some. And Paul says, he says, examine thyself. Is there any idol in the home of your heart? I'm not talking about a little wooden idol. I'm talking about anything in your life that takes the place of God. Anything in your life that takes the attention from God where it belongs to something else or to someone. Is there anybody in your life that you love more than God? Is there anybody in your life or anything in your life that you run to as your refuge when you should be running to God? Is there anything that brings you more joy than God? Anything that meets your needs instead of God? Is it money? Is it possession? You know, possessions and money are the quickest way to turn our hearts from God. We get all these things and we insure them and we wash them and we clean them and we show them off and we, we look good at them. And before long, our eyes and our hearts 
have turned from God. Is there anything in your life? Is, it, is your career, has your career turned your attention and time from life? Has your, I don't know, is your body, is your exercise, you've become so obsessed that it's beginning to turn your time and attention. What is it? Do you have any idol in the home of your heart? It's a good question. Good question for us to ask. But nevertheless, Michael, with her dishonesty, tricked Saul's servants, and, and David escapes out the window, and verse 18 says this, that, <laughs> there it is, third time, David fled and escaped. And he came to Samuel at Ramah, and he informed him. This, remember, this is the prophet that called him. This is the Billy Graham of his day. And he informed him of everything that Saul had done to him. He said, you got to understand what I'm going through. And he and Samuel went and stayed in Naoth. Now, it says here that he went from fleeing and escaping, and he ran to Samuel at Ramah. You remember where, uh, who Samuel was and who he represents for us? Samuel was the Old Testament prophet. He used to hear from God. His name means heard of God. He used to hear from God and speak to the nations on behalf of God when God was their king before they said, no, we want man to rule over us. And so in essence, David is running to what? The word of God. David in essence is running to God's representative. It's a picture of what we should do. We should run to God. Now, it's not just David that's running. It's not just you and I that runs when the pressure hits us. Everybody in this story is running. Look at this. Samuel runs in this story to the emotion of, or, or Saul, runs to the emotion of anger. He's trying to kill David. He runs to anger. That's his resort. resort. Michael, David's wife, runs to dishonesty. She begins to, that, that's just in her. David runs to Samuel, and when he runs to Samuel, Samuel grabs David by the hand, and they run somewhere else. So, so, so David runs to a person and this person takes David to a place, a place of worship, a place of worship, a place called Nioth that means dwelling. It means to dwell. And you know what they did there? They were worshiping. Did you know, by the way, that one theologian said this place, um, this Nioth means that it don't know means dwelling, but it wasn't even really the name of the city. It was the name of like the college. It was like a college dorm. So you got all these young preacher boys. Most people think Nathan, who we'll learn about later, was there. All these people that love God. All the spiritual influencers of the next generation. And here's the old man Samuel pouring into them. And Samuel now takes David to a place of worship. And what do they do? They begin to worship God. It's a picture of us when we run. Notice that the scripture said, this is what stood out. He, three times he fleeing and escaping, fleeing and escaping, fleeing and escaping. And then that last verse, it says he went and stayed. And how ironic that it says he went and stayed at a place that literally means dwelling. It's a picture for us that when we run, 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 we ought to get to the place where we go and stay and dwell in worship. That's what we ought to do. We ought to dwell in worship. We ought to run to worship and we ought to stay there and dwell. And this is what David is doing. David is now around other like-minded, God-fearing individuals, and they're running to worship. Where's your where? Where do you run to? Your where ought to be worship. We ought to run to worship. When you decide, like David, not to run back to the place that's harmful, the person that's harmful, the substance of this, that when you decide to run to God in worship, when you're up under pressure, what happens? Well, we're going to find out in this story. Okay, let's jump in back into it. Verse 19, it says, now... It was told Saul saying, so they told Saul saying, take note, David is uh, in Nioth and um, in Ramah. And then Saul sent messengers to take David. So he's saying, hey, I need you to go get him. I need you to go bring him back. I want to harm David. And when they saw the group of prophets, so he sent these servants prophesizing. And Samuel standing as the leader over them, the spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul. And they also began prophesizing. Now, what's that mean? You know what that means? It means prophesizing means uttering with a loud voice praises of God. In our terms, it would mean worshiping. These messengers sent to harm David were sent by Saul to go grab David, to go kill David. They show up, and what are they having? They're having a church service. And boy, is it a church service. They had never experienced anything like this. Here is Samuel, I mean the man, the aged prophet, leading in God's word and leading them in worship. And they start to come to harm David, and they think, man, it's kind of awkward to jump in now. I mean, they're kind of in the middle of worship. We'll let that one song roll, and then we'll, we'll get him. There he is right there. 
We got them spot now. So they let the run one song roll and it starts to, you know, starts to do something. <laughs> Man, it feels funny inside. You know what I mean? Like, oh. Just, just like this song that they roll right into. They didn't do a bridge. They roll right into that thing. Man, we'll just stay for this song. And they stay for this song. And the next song. Next song. Before they know it, they're, they're on the ground worshiping. I mean, they're just laid out worshiping God. And these are the ones that were supposed to come to home. They came with intent of war, and now they're worshiping. And, and, and Saul's frustrated. Where are they at? <laughs> These are my boys. I don't see David. I don't see a head of David. Guys, come, come on, come on, come on back. He brings some more people. He says, I want you to go finish what them bozos couldn't do. Go get David. Go, go. And so he sends him. And it says, verse 21 that um, when Saul was told, he sent other messengers. Now, they prophesied too. They, they saw the same worship experience. They showed up. What are, what are they doing? Idiots. They were posted. And now, we're here doing our job. Dang, that's a good tune. Dang. Oh, wow. Never been anywhere like this. And the Spirit of God starts hitting them. Before you know, they're worshiping too. Saul is hot. He's red hot. You, those of you who got employees and you just tell them a simple, something simple to do. This is not rock and science. Do this and they don't do it and it drives you crazy. My pet peeve is repeating myself. I hate repeating myself. I've got the staff now. They record me because I don't want to repeat myself. I just press rewind. I don't have a lot of pet peeves. Leaving the light on it. And repeating. Those are the only two I got. I don't want to repeat. And Saul's hot. He's red hot. 21 says this, and for a third time, Saul sent messengers. And they show up. And they, same thing. Can you imagine an environment so filled with the Spirit of God, with so many people worshiping and loving God and singing God, so many people enjoying God, God's presence that the presence of God falls on the enemies. Can you imagine a church where we have such a lifestyle of worship and when people come in here, they go, golly, I may be a skeptic, but I'm humble. they got something I don't got. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the church. Can you imagine your work, your environment, the gym, when people get around you and you have a lifestyle of worship, they feel something different. Even your enemies, even those who are still enemies of God, still trapped in their sin, begin to go, they, they got something that I want. I'll lean in and listen to them because they got something that I don't have. And maybe they don't show it on the exterior, but on the inside they go, they got something that I want. This is what's happening. Now Saul's hot. He's he ain't happy. And he says, I'll do it myself. I'll do it my you ever done that? I'll do it myself. You get tired of you get tired of when you just I'll do my uh my my wife's side of the family is this. They are do it yourself people. I won't I won't ask for nobody help. I'll just do it myself. My father in law owns a wedding uh, place. If you're local, it's making this place, it is the best place. I don't have no, uh, I need 10% off of that, but um, I just endorsed you. But he's a do-it-yourself person. The other week, there's like 300 chairs out there. We asked him three times, hey, I'll come, I'll come for church. I'll come help you get them chairs up. He had two weds back to back. I'll come, I'll come help you. Okay, okay. That night, I hear my wife, well, come help you, Daddy. Just let me know what time. We'll slide up there. Okay, okay. Well, I, we go for lunch and Never heard from them. Went up going to lunch on Sunday. I stayed up till two in the morning doing them chairs. I asked you three times. I gave you a lifeline. I'll help you. Well, he's just a do it himself person. That's what he's going to do. My wife the same way. She moved a Christmas box the other day. I swear to you, I thought it had a body in it. I said, where did this one come from? She said, I, this is the one I put up all by myself last year because you weren't around. Ouch. This one's so heavy, I'll make sure I'm not around this year, right? 
Saul's in this spot. He says, I'll do it myself. I'll do it. I'll do it myself. They can't do it. I'll go grab David. And everybody's going to know I'm coming because I'm the king. I got the robe. I got the crown. When I come walking into town, you're going to know you should have just done your job. And here's where it happens. Verse 22, it says, Then Saul also went to Ramah, and he came to the great well uh, that is in, say, who? So he asked, he starts asking people, and says, Where are Sam, Samuel and David? And I bet this struck some fear into people when the king is coming along saying, Where, Where's Samuel? Where's David? Let's talk. And someone said, oh, Hey, <laughs> they're right over there. Indeed, they're at Nioth in, uh, in Ramah. So he went there to Nioth and Ramah. Then the Spirit of God was upon him also. <laughs> and he went on and he prophesied until he came to Nioth and Ramah. He didn't even make it to the church service. The, the Spirit of God was so heavy upon those godly men and women there worshiping. It was so heavy that after the well, he begins worshiping God on the way. On the way. That's a word for somebody. You don't know where you're going or what God's doing in your life, but you need to worship on the way. You don't know how it's going to turn out. You, you, you don't know, do I turn, take left? Do I take right? Do I date them? Do I not? Do I do this? Do I do not? Just worship on the way. You worship on the way. Saul now, is, is the Spirit of God has fallen on him, and he's worshiping on the way, and he begins to strip out of his clothes. He, here's the king dropping his royal robe, and people are walking by going, that was a nice robe about a quarter of a mile back there. Did that, was that the king's robe? And now he's, he's coming out of his clothes, and he's beginning to, to, to worship God. Verse 24 says, it says, he stripped off all his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner. He laid down, so now he's laying down, naked all day and all night. Therefore, they say, people were coming by saying, is this Saul among the prophets? He had stripped down from his royal robe, took off his crown, took off his shoes. He stripped down to, in today's time, his T-shirt and his boxers. And people are saying, I didn't know Saul wore fruit of looms. I didn't know he was a, a, a fruit of a loom guy. Pictured him for more of an Under Armour, something more athletic. I'm kidding. I'm just making sure you're paying attention. And Saul is now stripped down to his undergarments, and he's laying on the ground, and he's, he's, he's worshiping. And people are walking by going, is Saul? Is that Saul at a church service? Is Saul have, the madman, the guy chasing the giant killer? The giant killer saved us, and he's chasing him trying to get, is that Saul? You ever done that in church? You done it. Hey, is that Saul? You're trying to tell your wife, but you can't because they're right there and they're not supposed to be in church because they're the biggest sinner in the whole city. And you go, is that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's going, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Is that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. What, mm -hmm. what are you talking about? Just speak loudly. Oh, you've done it too, haven't you? <laughs> That's what's happening. Saul's laying down worshiping people. Saul's having an encounter with God? Saul's at the Billy Graham crusade? Is that Saul in his underpants worshiping God? I thought I saw a shiny robe a quarter mile back there. How much can I get for it on eBay? I mean, they, it, it, it's blowing people's minds. And Saul is now under the Spirit worshiping. Running to God changed everything that day. Everything. It changed everything for David. It changed everything for his enemies. When we choose to run to God instead of other things, what does it do? Well, there's four things. Number one, it transforms us. It transforms us. Notice that three times Saul sent servants to harm David. All three times they come to harm David. They come with the intent of war only to remain there in worship. The Spirit of God fell upon them. Here's Saul who's angry, jealous, full of wrath, and he's on his face worshiping God. That's what running to God in worship does. It changes us. You can be stressed. You can be sad. You can be angry. You can be about to do something stupid. And when you run to God in worship, it changes us. It changes us. It just does. I do this all the time. I'll ask Dad. I'll say, I can't figure this out. You know, what I do about this, that? And he'll say, when was the last time you worshiped? 
And he, I don't even know if he knows that he tells me this all the time. It's the same answer every time. You worship God? Have you, have you been, you ought to just go worship. That's what he'll say all the time. No, okay. And it works every single time. Now, I don't, I don't come back with the answers, but I'm in a better place to find the answers. I come back a little bit less stressed. I come back a little bit more. My perspective changes because worship makes us look at God who's in control. We think we're controlling all this stuff and we got to do it. And we ain't got no answers. We can't figure it out. You don't know and I don't know either. <laughs> and, but when worship, we, we look to God who knows and who's in control of our future. It shifts our perspective. It changes everything. We see that Saul now is transformed. Music has, music influences Saul. Would we not agree? I mean, in the beginning when he's a madman, this is how David and him met. He was his music boy. And it would change. And so can you imagine the reason he got hit a quarter mile down the road and the servants didn't music influences Saul. And he hears this music like he never heard before. And, and he starts taking his clothes off on the way. Music does that, doesn't it? Music changes us on an emotional level. I mean, you can't, you can't not listen to MC Hammer, can't touch this. And it not, you don't want to dance. You can't let the Tootsie Roll come on. Just let it. Let it, let, just let the open line, cotton candy, sweet and good. And it's over. Saul's a quarter mile from this worship service. He's going, oh, I'm getting drawn in. And, and God's spirit falls upon him, and he begins to worship. Now, we ain't seen Saul worship like this since his calling. Remember that? I and mean, we, we ain't seen him do this since the very, very beginning. When he was a guy and Samuel found him, and remember he was hiding behind the baggage? He was a tall boy hiding behind the baggage. We ain't seen Saul do this since then. And now he's stripping himself of his clothes. You know what it is? It's symbolically saying the Spirit of God was so heavy upon him and so heavy upon his clothes that he strips down out of his garment and he's saying, I know that I was the king. I know I have the position. I know I have the power, but I am nothing in your sight. And he's taking it all off saying, I'm reminded I was just a boy behind the baggage. That's all I was. I was, I was just a boy behind the baggage before you found me, you promoted me, you gave me the power, you made me the king. I was nothing. That's what worship does to us. Worship will humble us. It will transform us. We may be on our high you know, horse and worship will say, hey, you, I gave you everything you got. Don't you forget, I'm the one that gave you the gift. Don't you think they're applauding you? They ain't applauding you. They're applauding the gift that I put in you. It, 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 it's me. That's what worship shifts our attention. It, it, where we say, God, I owe you everything. I have, I have nothing. I owe you everything. I was listening to something the other day. A preacher was talking. I think he was talking over at Psalms 103. You guys got that? Psalms 103 where he says he himself is talking about God knows our frame. He's talking about how weak we are. He's mindful that we are just, but we are but dust. He's saying you came from just dust. Don't, don't think you're something huge. And this preacher is explaining this and talking about how we should give God glory for everything. We should be grateful for everything. And he shares this scripture and there's a little bit of boy in the audience. He says, wow, I never thought about it like that. Preacher, now that you say it like that, I, man, God did all this. You're right. I owe him everything. I mean, after all, I mean, all that he did for us, and we're just nothing but butt dust. <laughs> and the preacher's like, okay, that didn't go in. There's a difference between B-U-T and B-U-T-T. -T. <laughs> all right. But I got laughing at it. I said, you know, that's not a bad way to go through life. We start getting arrogant. We start getting full of pride. We start wanting some attention for ourselves. So you better remember, you, boy, you ain't nothing but butt dust. <laughs> it's, it's right there. Right? And Saul now is stripped of all his... his power and all his signifying his position and he's saying I'm terrified to do anything but worship I'm, I am terrified to do anything but, but, but to worship you that's what worship does it, it puts our attention on us on him it, it transformed us and now Saul is temporarily transformed but it also not only transforms us but it unites us it unites us did you know that this is the only time in Scripture that Samuel, Saul, and David were in the same place at the same time? Look it up. Only time that Samuel, the old prophet, that was God's mouthpiece before the people said, no, we don't want that. We want a king like other nations. He's there. Saul, who God has rejected, is there. David, who God has chosen, is there. It's the only time that they're all together. How were they all three in the same spot? What brought them together? Worship. It was worship. Worship unites us, don't it? It's why we can 
sit in here, we can have people from different backgrounds, different colors, different weights, different heights, different political views. We all, the fact is, if we weren't Christians, we wouldn't disagree with a lot of the stuff with each other. We couldn't even sit down at a table if we weren't Christians because you'd have a different opinion, I'd have a different, but you know what unites us? We all have the same Father. And man, we, we love Him and we come together, we throw all that garbage out the window, don't we? We go, I'm here to worship a King who's worthy to, to, to be praised. This is why during 2020 we did so many of those nights of worship. It wasn't because I missed you. I'd love to say I missed you. I'm kidding. Wish I did miss you a little bit. You know, there was so much division in 2020. I said, the only thing that brings unity, when a world has division, let the world have division. Worship brings unity. That's why we can all come in here and we, we can love each other. We are brothers and sisters of Christ. I say it all the time this way. If you don't like the way this looks, how diversified this is, you're not going to like heaven. Because heaven's diversified. Okay? So get used to it here because this is what heaven's going to look like. All right? And so it, un it unites us. It brings us together. This, by the way, is the first time that David has ever been in the presence with other people that were God-fearing like him, that were worshiping him like him, like, like Nathan and like all these other, you know, next generation spiritual leaders. They're all here together at this college dorm and they're worshiping. David had never experienced anything like this. David is used to worshiping privately in the pasture. This is David's first view of public worship. Do you know that? This is where his passion came for public worship. Later we'd see it when he brought the ark back. Where did it start? Right here. Around all these preacher boys that love God. He said, this is great. My goodness. I mean, it's been fantastic. Me privately worshiping. But this is great. And this is where his enthusiasm came. When he was united with other believers who were worshiping. So worship transforms us when we run to it. Worship unites us when we run to it. But worship also protects us. It protects us. The enemy that day was Saul and Saul's servants. But notice it was worship that stopped the enemy's plans from being able to touch God's man. It was worship. Not a one of them laid a hand on David that day. They knew where he was, but in the words of the philosopher M.C. Hammer, they can't touch this. They could touch him. It was worship that stopped them. It was worship that, that, that stopped them from being able to do the wickedness in their heart that they wanted to do. You know that there's an enemy after you. Maybe he's not running after you with spears and servants, but you've got you an enemy. You, you, you got an enemy that wants to destroy your life. See, you've got your plan for your life, God's plan for your life, and the enemy's plan for your life. And the enemy wants to come and kill, steal, and destroy. And he's searching, seeking, roaming those who he can go around. It says he's like a roaring lion looking for those who he can devour. You know how he comes and how he wants to hurt us? It's called the three Ds is what I always, I always categorize them. This way. He wants to distract us from our mission, from our purpose, or, or from whatever, God's love. He wants to discourage us, and He wants to divide us. He wants to divide us from each other so that we do not have peace among relationship. See, remember, He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's stolen peace. He wants to distract you, maybe by something that's not your mission, or maybe by thinking you've got to earn your way for God to love you when God loves you unconditionally. God already knows everything you've done, everything you will do, yet He loves you. Maybe He wants to do that. Or he wants to come and he wants to discourage us by stealing our joy, by stealing our peace. You remember the guy in the Bible that had all those demons in him and he was in the graveyard and Jesus came? What if this guy was absolutely miserable? He was cutting himself. He was in torment. He had had all these things, what, stolen from him, joy, peace. All. The enemy wants to do the same thing to you. He comes to distract us, discourage us, divide us. But worship protects us. Worship protects us. Remember what we looked at a couple of weeks ago. Keep your sight on Jesus if you want to keep your song. Don't lose your song. Keep your hand on the harp. You know that I think it's funny. This is hilarious. That, that Michael, David's wife, didn't go with him. <laughs> she left him. She, she, I mean, I think it shows a lot about her and her foundation. Maybe this is where, Spall, you know, where, where Saul, we kind of see a little bit of his spiritual foundation as well. Maybe it rubbed off on Michael because she said, I ain't going but you. You're on your, you, you, you're on your own. And you know the only thing that David had climbing out that window? He didn't have a wife to hold on to by his side. He had a harp. And he kept his hand on the harp. No matter what you go through, keep your hand on the harp. Keep your song. Keep your sight on Jesus. Continue to worship. 
through that. Because worship, when we keep our eyes on him, protects us. It protects us from the enemy's attempts. So it transforms us, it unites us, it protects us. But finally, when we run to it, here's what we're going to find. It reveals us. When we worship authentically, it reveals what's in us for David, for Samuel, for all the other aspiring preachers that day and prophets. It revealed what? Their love for God. I mean, they were on fire. They were, they, they loved. But for Saul, it reveals something different. He looked the part. He looked sincere. He has his ro royal robe a quarter of a mile back there. He's laying on the ground all day and all night. He looked on the outside like he had a change of heart. He had a spiritual encounter with God that many people thought would change him forever. You know how many people walked by and said, is that Saul prophesied? Finally, he, he was a madman. He's changed. There'll be peace in the nation. The leader has changed. The leader has had an encounter with God. But I want to tell you something. Transformation doesn't happen. Transformation is only temporarily without repentance. It's only temporary. You can be in the presence of God. You can be in worship. And that feeling is only temporary without repentance. See, you can be all around religion and not have repentance. It's repentance that changes us. And worship reveals where we are spiritually. It reveals whether we're good <laughs> and we're just praising God for all the good. Or it reveals, you know, I have something that I need to change. I have something that I need to do. I have something that I need to get right about. And Saul didn't change it. It says Saul worshiped, Saul prophesied, but we never see a verse saying, and Saul repented. Because Saul would have changed forever had he had had genuine, true repentance to God. Genuine, true repentance. It would have been more lasting than just what we saw. And sadly, Saul went right back to hunting David that day. He changes it in a moment. Others see it. I mean, others are, God, oh, they're so excited about it. They thought the nation was going to be turned around. This is it. Did you hear about Saul? Did you hear about the change? But it didn't last. Why? Because Saul never repents. Worship reveals what we need to do. It reveals whether we're good or whether we need to get right. And God always gives us what I call a space for repentance, a time, a space. We see it with Jonah. We see it with Nineveh. He gives us a time, and God is so loving that he lets us choose. He, he, let, he knows the things that we are doing will change us, yet he gives us this spot to say there's a better way. And he gives us a space of repentance, and this is Saul's warning spot. This, when we look in Scripture, is going to be the last time that we see Saul fall on his face and have a spot, a space to repent. It's all downhill from here for Saul. But God is so loving. Think about this, that earlier he took the Spirit of God from David, I mean from Saul, remember, and he put it on David. And now here, what does it say? The Spirit of God fell upon Saul. For for just a moment in this worship service, he said, one more time, Saul, one more time. I know you've done things that I've that you turned your back against me. I know, I know you've done some evil things, but one more time, I'll give you a space to repent. That's what worship does. But Saul chooses not to repent. I was reading a commentary this week. I'm old school. I love old. This one's like from the 1800s. Okay, got reprinted, 19 something, but it's still relevant today. Does not God, in His merciful providence, often deal with the transgressors as He dealt with Saul? placing them in circumstances that make it comparatively easy for them to turn from their sins and change their life. Harden not your hearts. Who knows whether ever again you shall have this opportunity. I don't know about you, but that last line got me. I, I, I leaned in, I wrote it down, I highlighted it. Mm. Can you imagine, who knows with what you're going through, if this, is the if this is the space to repent, if this is the last moment before God says, okay, you want to go that way? Have at it. I've tried. I've knocked on your door. I've tried over and over. But if you want to keep running to that, you can run to that. But my choice is so much better. My plans for you are so much. Repent and run to me. That's what, that's what God is calling us to do, to repent. And, to, and worship reveals that. And I, I want to say this. Just like we open up this story, we're talking about my son running into the you know, to the room and him barely missing that little peck, speck of little glass. I almost brought it with me. I'll, I'll perhaps bring it tomorrow. And it, it could fit on the tip of my finger. It's just little. 
But I guarantee you last night he had run in there and he had stepped on it. It would have injured him. I want to tell you, you might have something in your heart that's so little that you think that don't matter. It's so little. It, it, it just, it's not a big deal. I mean, have you seen what God's probably looking at? They're saying it's way worse. This is so, but is God revealing something, little or big, in your heart where you say, you know, maybe this is my space. I need to get right with God. I need to get right with others. You know, it's impossible to be right with God and, and, and to be right with God and not to be right with others, the other believers, right? You do know that's impossible. It's literally impossible to say, I'm right with God, but I'm not right with the other Christian brothers. It's impossible. If you're wrong with the other believers and other Christians, you can't be right with God. And so what is, what is God calling you to do? Because worship reveals what we ought to do. It transforms us. It um, protects us. It unites us. But it reveals for us what we need to do. So what is God calling you to do this evening? What's he calling you to do? What, what is he telling you to do? And I promise you this, God's always for you. If you'll just do it, just take the thinking out of you and say, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it. If God's calling me to do it, if God's calling me to make it right, I'll do it. I promise you, God's plans are for you, not against you. Now, if you're here tonight for the first time and perhaps someone brought you here and uh, you said, man, that's, that's a cool story, but here's the thing. Uh, I don't know God. How do I worship a God I, I don't know? How do I run to him and worship him if I, if I don't know him? I want to tell you how you can know him. The most important thing that you will ever know, ever do, is make Jesus the Lord of your life. If not, everything else is just temporal. I mean, everything, every decision you make, it ain't, when you breathe your last breath, the Bible says that there's a time to be born and a time to die. Every one of us has got a date on us, okay? We've got a date on our head. And the, here's the thing, we don't know when that date, we don't know when that time comes up. So the one thing that matters is, do you know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior? Do you know where you'll spend eternity? We, isn't it funny how us human beings will spend time planning vacations, planning retirements, planning all this stuff, careers, and going to college? We just plan, and we plan, and we plan, and we got the calendar, we got the ever. We, 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 we are good at planning, but no one plans for eternity. I mean, there's a world out there that goes, well, I'll just, you know, I don't want to think about that. That's kind of scary. No, don't, don't, don't you want to, won't you want to know that? You don't want to be the one that plans for everything else, but don't plan for eternity. Do you know where you'll spend eternity? Do you know when you breathe your last breath? When you breathe your last breath, it ain't going to matter how many cars you got in the garage. It ain't going to matter how many, how much money you got in the bank. It ain't going to matter how many friends you got on Facebook. They can't help you. The only thing that matters is do I know Jesus? Have I ever repented of my sins, realized that I'm a sinner, and said, God, save me, come into my heart? He made it pretty easy for us, right? <laughs> I mean, he did all the work. Literally, all we've got to do is put down our pride and put our faith in God. I mean, we, it's there. But for many people, they think, ah, I'm going to figure it out. I'll keep going on my own. I'll get better, then I'll come to God. That's not how it works. You come just as you are. And you let him do the changing, okay? And so if you have never come to God, and I, I want to lead you in a, in a prayer where you can do so. Perhaps the very reason you're here, the very reason you're here is to do that. So I'm going to leave you in a prayer right now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father, thank you so much for your word to us tonight, Lord. May we run to you in worship. My prayer is for that person that is sitting here right now or watching online, and they don't know where they'd spend eternity. They don't know you as their Lord and Savior. But God, they want to know you. I mean, they're here, they're searching, they want to know you. Deep within their spirit, they know that you're speaking directly to them right here in this moment. I pray that you would give them courage to do what you're calling them to do. So if you'd like to have Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, if you'd like to have heaven as your home, simply say this prayer in your heart, and you believe on it with everything you got. Are you ready? Say, Father, I know that I'm a sinner, and I know that I cannot save myself. I believe that your son, Jesus, died on a cross for my sins. I believe that your son, Jesus, rose from the dead. And I believe that your son, Jesus, is Lord. So today, the best way I know how, I ask you, God, come into my life. Save me. 
I make you the Lord of my life. I'll never be ashamed of you. I look forward to enjoying a relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. If this ministry or this message has touched your life in any way, please send us your story to I am at CascadeHills.com. Now, if you'd like to financially support this ministry as it continues to spread the word of Jesus Christ around the globe, you can go to our website, CascadeHills.com, or download our free mobile app and click on the Give button. We invite you to check out some of our other messages or tune in live every weekend, Saturdays at 4 or 6 p.m. or Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day.